going over IRS Schedule B, interest and ordinary dividends. Uh, taxpayers gener generally need to use Schedule B if any of the following uh, situations occur. Uh, you had over $1,500 of taxable interest or ordinary dividends reported for the tax year. If you received interest from a seller finance mortgage and the buyer used the property as a personal residence, if you have accrued interest from a bond, if you're reporting original issue discount of less than the amount that was shown on your Form 1099-OID, if you're reporting interest income that's less than the amount shown on a Form 1099 due to amortizable bond premium, if you're claiming the exclusion of interest from a series EE or I savings bonds issued after 1989, uh, you received interest or ordinary dividends as a nominee, or if you had a financial interest in or signature authority over a financial account in, located in a foreign country, or if you received a distribution from, if you were a grantor of, or a transfer to, a foreign trust. So there are some specific instructions for each part. Uh, let me go over them, uh, the, the, the parts, uh, briefly, and then we'll circle back up to the top and, and start with part one going down. So in part one, we'll enter, uh, we'll enter all of the different interest uh, income items. In part two, we'll report ordinary dividends uh, these are different from qualified dividends. So if you receive a 1099 DIV, then you can assume that all dividends you receive are, are ordinary dividends unless the company that issued the 1099 DIV specifies certain dividends as qualified dividends. And then in part three, foreign accounts and trusts. Not every taxpayer needs to complete part three. We'll discuss those who do momentarily. So let's circle back to the top of the form. Uh, before you even start with part one, you should make sure that your taxpayer information at the top uh, matches the rest of your income tax return. It should if you're using standard tax preparation software then you'll see that uh, most of this uh, just auto flows from your software. So in part one, you're going to uh, report uh, all of the different lines of interest in, uh, in line one, and then we're going to do some calculations. But first, I'll go over a couple of notes that you should be aware of from the form instructions. So. Uh, typically, you'll enter the name of the payer and over here and then the amount here. So let me put down an example. Acme uh, Savings and Trust, and then you would enter $1,000, for example. And then if you had you know, interest from you know, either treasury bonds or municipal bonds, you would include all of those in here, uh, it, some specific items to note though. Uh, so if it comes down to seller financed mortgages, this is where you uh, sell, sell a property, but instead of the bank issuing a mortgage to the buyer, uh, you would act as the bank. And so the person maybe puts down a, a down payment and then pays you uh, a combination of principal and interest over a certain period of time, just like they would with a bank, except except they're paying you, uh, then you would need to make sure that uh, you're capturing the name, address, and social security number of that individual, and then that individual needs your social security number uh, when they file their income tax return. So uh, there is a $50 pay, uh, penalty for any taxpayer that either does not present the buyer's information on, on here. So let's just say John Smith, um, three, two, one, any, any road, any town, Texas. And then you would enter a social security number. 
So that's how you would list a seller financed mortgage, and then you would enter the amount of interest over here. Uh, so if you're a nominee, this means that you received interest uh, that actually belonged to someone else. So you would report that here, but then under your last line one entry, you would put a subtotal of all interest. Below that, you would enter nominee distribution, and then you would show the interest that you received as a nominee. You would subtract that amount, and then you, so this is what it would look like. You would say down here, you would have subtotal, and then you would have $3,000. And then right here, you would have nominee distribution. And let's just say this Acme Savings and Trust was nominee distribution. So you would report it up here, then you'd report it as a nominee distribution, and then you would subtract, you, you would subtract that amount. So you would end up putting $2,000 in line two. But if you did not put the subtotal or the nominee distribution, then you'd have to combine all of these items up here and it would be $3,000 instead. So uh, accru uh, there are a couple of other situations where you would do something similar, like if you're excluding interest income for uh, accrued interest. So this is what happened, like when you buy a savings bond in between the dates uh, where interest is paid. Let's just imagine that you buy a savings bond where they pay interest uh, every six months. So you buy it exactly in the middle, three months after and three months uh, before the next interest payment. So you may receive, uh, you may be receive a form 1099 because you bought the bond and it accrued interest, but you never actually, uh, you, you never actually receive the interest because that technically would that three months of interest that accrued belongs to the seller uh, as of the date that you bought it. So let's imagine that six months of interest will be uh, $1,000. You might receive a 1099 INT form showing $500 of accrued interest. Uh, well, you can report that and you should report it. Let's just say that uh, this, let's just say that this was $1,000 of accrued interest and now you have to back that out. So you do the same thing that you did for a nominee distribution. You would simply take the, that portion out and you would write accrued interest instead. Original issue discount. So you would follow the similar rules uh, uh, under the nominees and accrued interest. If you're reporting uh, original issue discount less than what was shown on your 1099, uh, OID. So either in box one, which would be the original issue discount for the year, or box eight, which would be the original issue discount on U.S. Treasury obligations. So you would do the same thing here. You would report it, and then instead of accrued interest or nominee distribution, you would write OID adjustment. And then uh, if you had amortizable bond premium, you would do the same thing, except you would write a ABP adjustment for amortizable bond premium. Um, and then if you had tax exempt interest, then uh, you would see that either in your 1099 INT box eight or your 1099 OID box two. So box uh, tax exempt OID shows up in box 11 of your 1099 OID. So you would enter the amount of tax exempt interest on line T 2A of your form 1040 or your 1040 SR. Um, if you bought your tax exempt bond at a premium, then you would only report the net amount that's above that premium. Uh, and same with tax-exempt OID. If you bought it at a premium, you would only report the net amount uh, of, of that tax-exempt OID above and beyond the premium. Uh, you would also include any exempt interest, interest 
dividends from a mutual fund on line 2A of your tax return. So uh, once we've gone through all of these adjustments, uh, you may find that you need more than one uh, uh, Schedule B to list all of the different payers. And you can use multiple uh, versions of this sheet. You would simply stack up all the totals in one uh, Schedule B. So in line three, uh, w once we've got the total amounts uh, correctly calculated uh, on line two, then you would go to line three. You would enter the amount of excludable interest on series EE and I savings bonds that were issued after 1989. So uh, you would need to complete and attach IRS form 8815, which reports this excludable interest uh, for certain taxpayers that used that income for qualified education expenses. Generally, it would be pa uh, parents of college age students redeeming their savings bonds so that they can pay for higher education expenses that would, in that kind of a circumstance where you uh, qualify and you complete IRS form 8815, you would include that amount of interest here. So let's just imagine that we had a separate line for uh, so you had you had that um, and if we didn't have any of these other line items then you would have a total of four thousand dollars but a thousand dollars of it would be excludable under the circumstances you would attach your completed form 80, uh, 8815 and then you would back that out and you would have three thousand dollars of reportable interest so um, now if this amount happens to be over $1,500, then you have to complete part three. Disregard the fact that it says foreign accounts and trusts. Uh, anyone that has over $1,500 in either part one or part two needs to complete part three, even if it's a straightforward no, no, and no. Uh, we'll get to that part in just a second. So in part two, we'll, or, uh, we'll report ordinary uh, dividends uh, in a very similar fashion. Uh, if you uh, had more than 10% of either the value of a foreign corporation stock or the combined voting power of that corporation's voting stock, then you might also need to file IRS Form 5471. Uh, and you would follow the instructions for that. That is in the instructions. Uh, so ordinary income or dividends are basically you're reporting them in the same manner that you would report from uh, interest uh, income from part one. But this is from ownership of uh, companies that are paying dividends as opposed to ownership of uh, interest paying in instruments such as bonds and CDs. So let's just say Home Depot stock, right? So Home Depot paid $1,000 of dividends and you did not own it long enough for them to be qualified dividends, so they're still ordinary dividends. Uh, let's see. Um, so Utility stocks are notorious for paying dividends, and this this one, XYZ Electric Company, paid $5,000. If you receive dividend income as a nominee, you would do the same thing as we did up, up in part one, which is total, subtotal, $6,000, and then... Um, And then you would uh, total that up accordingly, and you would report $5,000. So uh, your interest income gets reported on line 2B of your Form 1040 or 1040 SR. That's your ordinary interest income. Uh, line 2A reports tax-free interest. Line 2B reports taxable. Uh, for ordinary dividends, you would report that in line 3B. Uh, 
And then again, if the, if this line six amount is over $1,500, you would need to complete part two. So, uh, or sorry, part three. Part three, you have to complete part three if you had over $1,500 either in part one or part two. If you had a foreign account at any point, or if you received a distribution from, if you're a grantor of, or if you're a transfer or to a foreign trust. So uh, question 7A, did you have a financial interest in, it or in or a signature authority over a financial account? This could be a bank account, an investment account that was located in a foreign country. You would, uh, following the instructions, uh, basically the instructions kind of give a little bit more guidance, but not a whole heck of a lot. Uh, you would need to possibly, uh, you would need to indicate whether or not you're required to file FinCEN Form 114, which is a report of Foreign Bank and Financial Accounts, or FBAR. Uh, to report that authority. So that is completely offline. You would need to know that um, independent of this article, uh, but you would check whether or not you need to. So in this case, John Doe, he's a proud American. He doesn't have any financial interest in anything overseas. He's simply completing part three because of the amounts of indicated in lines uh, four and six. If you were required to file FinCEN Form 114, then you would list the name of the country or countries where you, your accounts are located. And then finally in eight, uh, during the tax year, did you receive a distribution from, were you a grantor of, or did you transfer assets to a foreign trust? If you did, you might be required to uh, file IRS Form 38, 3520, which is the annual return to report transactions with foreign trusts and receipt of cert certain foreign gifts. And if you were a grantor of, or if you transferred assets to, if you're considered a, an owner under grantor trust rules, then you would also have to make sure that the trust itself files IRS Form 3520-A, which is the annual information return of a foreign trust with a U.S. owner. So this, that's all we have for this uh, Schedule B. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, most taxpayers will only need to complete uh, Parts 1 and 2, and the ones that do complete Part 3 should probably know whether or not they have assets in a foreign account. Or uh, So it, it, if it's relatively straightforward, you can probably complete it yourself. Uh, those of you who uh, feel like you know that you're tax situation has some complexity you'd probably but be you would probably be better off having a tax professional go over your uh, schedule b and all the required forms so uh, you can learn more about this we actually break this down into a little bit more detail in our article which you can find in uh, on our website simply go to teachmepersonalfinance.com type in irs schedule b and our article should appear if you like our articles, please subscribe to our newsletter. And if you like our YouTube videos, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please post them in the comments section. Uh, I will list uh, links to all the forms that we discussed during this uh, video. They will be in the show notes as well. So uh, if you have any questions, please reach out. Otherwise, have a great day. Thank you very much.